Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Finnovate podcast. Joining me today, we have Emmanuel Daniel, author of The Great Transition, The Personalization of Finance, and founder of Tab Global, publishers of The Asian Banker. Emmanuel, thank you so much for taking the time to connect with me today. Greg, I'm very pleased to be on your show, and I didn't realize that we both were in, that you actually live in Seattle. I was just there a few, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, and uh, we could have done this live. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, clearly a missed opportunity there. Um, but anyway, happy to have you on the line today. So for people who haven't uh, spent too much time thinking about Tab Global or, or maybe who haven't read the book, can you start with just a quick introduction of yourself and sort of how you came to be in the position you are now? Well, Greg, I am the founder of something that was originally called The Asian Banker, uh, which was like a you know publishing and research and consulting company uh, right across the Asia Pacific region. Um, I had this, uh, you know, interest in building a business that was cross-border. Uh, and with the name The Asian Banker, it, it took me across uh, something like 19 countries, uh, you know, with, with sound banking systems, everything from Korea to Australia, from the Philippines, uh, eventually into the Middle East and Africa today. So, uh, and, and that's why we needed to be rebranded as Tab Global. And, uh, and, uh, and, and with that platform, uh, I had a front seat view uh, of the development of the financial services industry uh, in uh, any number of uh, emerging markets. Um, and then uh, worked my way back into the U.S. Uh, because um, all of the U.S. banks that I engaged with, banks in Asia, Citibank, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, uh, you know, when, when they come to my part of the world, they, they interact with me a lot. And, and through that, um, you know, I've I've gotten um, I've become very good friends, and funnily enough, uh, you become better friends with some of the chairman of the large banks in the U.S. If you're from Asia, than if you are actually living in the U.S., uh, because you know they give you the time of the day when they come to your part of the world. Sure. Um, you know, so so like my book, for example, uh, the forward was written by Barney Frank. Uh, you know who who co-authored the Dodd-Frank Act. And he's a really close friend of mine. Uh, we disagree on just about everything, but and <laughs> we are arguing all the time, uh, you know. But um, but those are the relationships that I've I've developed over time, um, you know. And and the business grows um, on its own. So then I you know I put together uh, what I think I was seeing in terms of the development of the industry. I was too banking focused, so it took me a very long time to write this book. But I needed to, you know, pull myself out of the banking industry uh, and look back into it uh, and, and then to take a view in terms of uh, where it's heading and how uh, it will ev ev uh, eventually evolve. Uh, and that is why the title of the book is The Personalization of Finance is Here. Uh, I think that the overall direction of the finance industry uh, is the dismantling of intermediation uh, and the empowering of the individual uh, to be able to carry out transactions on its own. And we need to have this thinking at the back of our minds because, um, you know, no matter uh, who we are in terms of you know, being innovators uh, and introducing new technologies and stuff, uh, we need to have a roadmap uh, in terms of uh, what's substantial and consequential in terms of where the industry is going uh, and what is uh, incremental and, um, you know, and, and protects the, the incumbency of the industry uh, for what it is. Uh, so I'm able to take a view uh, on um, a lot of the fintechs uh, evolving right now, uh, how they're funded and, and which ones will evolve. The big theme in my mind uh, is really the, the eventual convergence of decentralized and, and traditional finance. Uh, and I think that um, there's a lot happening on that front uh, this year, um, you know, and it's, it's coming together quite well. Yeah, no, really interesting. Uh, thank you for that background. I think anybody listening should go out and take a look at that book um, and, and get a sense, of, again, of, of where you're coming from. But I think what, what really fascinates me and what I want to talk about today is looking at you know all of these kind of different 
uh, pressures that are coming from different places in the geopolitical arena and how those are affecting the banking and fintech ecosystems, because there's so much going on. And so many of the people that I've talked to so far this year are sort of doom and gloom about it. You know, 2024 is going to be a year full of all these painful situations. It's going to be something I hope we can survive it. Nobody's really talking about it from the standpoint of, I hope uh, that we can thrive here, that we can do something aggressive and really go out and grow. At least people that I'm talking to aren't, aren't uh, approaching it from that standpoint. So I'd like to get your perspective on you know, what you see as the factors that are really going to affect the fintech ecosystem. Obviously, you travel to so many different countries, have such a unique perspective. You're uniquely positioned to be able to really get into this. What's going to be affecting banking and fintech this year from a global scale? So I see a number of, uh, I, I give a number of uh, first principles in my book. And one of the first, first principles really is that uh, the future of finance is uh, is not uh, crafted by design, um, and and those of us who work with regulators uh, who who know how to you know keep our nose clean and and do as we're told uh, would find this a little bit unnerving. In that the future of finance has always been uh, created uh, in periods of stress, uh, drama, uh, desperation. Um, you know, and 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 a need to change, um, you know, and it's never out of design and purposefulness. So, for example, right now we find that uh, the traditional banking industry thinks that it has aced uh, the 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 threat that was coming to it from decentralized finance, from cryptocurrencies, and so on. Uh, but they haven't, uh, you know, and and uh, the next inflection point uh, will come at a point of need. Uh, and on a geopolitical level, the big inflection point that we uh, that we can all look forward to uh, is the threat uh, to the dominance of the U.S. dollar as a global trading currency. Um, you know, the funny thing is that it was uh, Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine war, that made uh, any number of countries, from Switzerland to Brazil to South Africa, uh, Saudi Arabia, and then of course China as well. To say to, to themselves that, you know something, uh, if we're all going to be beholden to the dollar and all our dollar clearing has to go through the U.S. and the New York Department of Finance and, and the Federal Reserve Bank has, uh, has the final authority on how the dollar is cleared, um, you know, it puts us all at risk. And so any number of countries around the world are looking for alternative arrangements. Uh, they're not necessarily... Uh, wanting to see uh, the decline of the dollar or the role of the U.S. in the in global economics, it's just that they want to have alternatives, uh, and so they are, they're searching for that. Now, the U.S. on its part uh, wants its debt uh, to be um, still attractive as a form of investment globally. I mean, you know, right up to today, uh, the best form the the best form of uh, of an investable asset for any central bank is, is a U.S. Treasury bond, um, you know, next to gold. So, um, but that, even that is, uh, um, you know, up in the air at the moment because of um, the yields are, are not there anymore uh, and there are other alternatives and stuff like that. So I see that uh, there will be incremental developments taking place where the U.S. will uh, for all the drama that we see taking place today in uh, accepting cryptocurrencies in the U.S., the SEC, and so on, there will it will just come to an inflection point where I believe that the U.S. will validate some form of a digital form of its own currency. Uh, and it probably will not be uh, in the form of a central bank digital currency in the way that it was originally uh, conceived, uh, because the Bank for International Settlements itself has changed its stance on the idea of a central bank digital currency. It doesn't see that it should be uh, a form of uh, currency that is issued by the central bank direct to the consumer. What, what the BIS is saying today is that uh, every bank should be able to tokenize its deposit base. Um, and they are trying to promote this idea globally. And if the U.S., um, you know, puts in place legislation where banks can tokenize their deposits. Uh, banks effectively become issuers of their own stable coins. You know, for one of a better word, I mean, they are like stable coins, but they are not. They are bank digitized bank deposits. Uh, and when a currency is digitized, 
um, it, it then becomes easily tradable and usable on a global basis. When we look at um, all of the major developments in the U.S., the creation of a central bank in 1907, for example, the, the falling out uh, of the gold standard in 1971, um, each of these developments took place at, at points of extreme stress when the U.S. wasn't able to uh, meet its obligations anymore, notwithstanding any of the discussions that were going on, you know, for the 30 years prior to. For the 30 years prior to the development of or the introduction of central banking in the U.S., uh, the U.S. was, um, you know, firmly against the idea of a U.K.-style uh, Bank of England. Uh, you know, and and thirty years before, um, you know, getting out of the 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 gold standard, uh, all of the economists in the U.S. Um, you know, subscribed to the idea that that the gold standard was uh, the way for an economy to be run. You know, and then after that, we go into floating currencies. So we we will have to wait to see the next inflection point. It will come uh, at a point of crisis. Now, um, the digitization of the deposit business uh, is taking place. Uh, quietly um, in many different parts of the world. And I think that uh, central banks are putting in place infrastructure where instead of issuing uh, uh, a uh, ubiquitous uh, central bank digital currency, what central banks now want to do is to issue a, a wholesale version of the digital currency issued by the central banks, but traded only among the commercial banks. And then the commercial banks, in turn, uh, digitize their deposit business and tokenize it uh, so that their, their, their customers can can use their their deposits as a token instead of uh, as an account uh, in as a you know, on the balance sheet. Um, so uh, I am saying I'm probably one of the few people who are saying that there's going to be uh, incredible development in this area. Uh, in a number of countries, uh, and that the U.S. will become increasingly um, acceptable uh, to to this as a as a form of digitizing uh, the dollar. So, so I'm actually talking about geopolitics on one hand uh, and the um, evolution of the financial infrastructure on the other, uh, both of which are happening in parallel, uh, and they will come together at some point in time. Yeah, no, this is really interesting, and I uh, appreciate the the comprehensive background there. I want to switch things now back into kind of the fintech ecosystem in particular. What does this mean for people who are on kind of the innovation side of the fintech ecosystem right now? What do they need to be doing in order to kind of get ready for this potential major shift? Um, something that uh, fintech, a lot of fintech players have been doing, and they really need to reflect on this. Uh, when they look at their respective business models, uh, is to ask themselves how much of the business models are about the industrialization of finance, or finance as we know it to be, and how much of it is actually digitization of finance as we want it to be. Um, many fintechs uh, actually serve to industrialize uh, what banks already do. And when they do that, they they inadvertently end up, you know, subsidizing the bank's operational costs. They actually absorb it uh, into their innovations and, uh, you know, and, and they have maybe one or two banks as their clients uh, and they're unable to scale. Um, digitization of finance needs to result um, in a, a different product altogether and a different relationship with the customer or the user of finance and, and different outcomes that, that are measurable. Uh, so, for example, when when we talk about uh, themes like uh, um, you know inclusive finance, uh, financial inclusion, uh, the measurable uh, goal of financial inclusion is not a million people being onboarded to the financial system as we know it to be. Um, it it should result in the cost of credit uh, actually you know going down and becoming much more affordable to those millions of people. So, for example, today, when we talk about financial inclusion uh, in places where, um, you know, where, where uh, millions of poor people are being onboarded um, onto the financial system, the, 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 the credit cost is easily 28 to 32 percent, um, you know, per annum, uh, which, 
it means that despite all the technology being put into the system, uh, the cost of credit didn't go down. But with better um, you know, profiling and better uh, credit risk assessments and, and doing that on time, uh, uh, in real time, and, and making that part of supply chains uh, in, in closed communities and so on, uh, we should be able to uh, reduce the cost of credit and access to the cost of credit uh, much more profoundly than we are today. So, um, so the, the thing that fintech players need to do is to restate what it is that they're measuring uh, that will indicate that they're doing something uh, transformational uh, in finance going forward. Now, the digitization of bank accounts uh, is going to result in a number of unintended consequences. Um, one of the unintended consequences is if the average bank account holder becomes accustomed uh, to a digitized bank account. And by digitized, I don't just mean that your account is digital because you have a digital banking account, but that your account is tokenized and that you can actually download a token from your bank and have that transacted with uh, other individuals uh, freely. Uh, when they become uh, accustomed to that, they will also become accustomed to um, you know, cryptocurrencies. And there are hundreds of cryptocurrencies with different utilities, uh, different programmings put into them, and so on. And, and, um, and you start seeing the individual taking charge of how he wants uh, to configure his financial relationships. Uh, and when he does that, uh, the, the power of the relationship then uh, shifts to the individual from the institution. Uh, and this is how innovators in finance need to think about the future of finance. Um, you know, and, and now that we have AI being um, you know, inserted into a transaction, what AI does is enable the processing uh, to be able to make sense of far more data and information than it ever was, uh, than, than, than um, you know, uh, transactors or the platforms were able to in the past. So if you take, say, for example, peer-to-peer um, -peer players, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer lending or peer-to-peer -peer investments, uh, in the past, all that they were trying to do was to try and match uh, borrowers and lenders to each other. But what they probably didn't realize is that the conversation is the product. In other words, a lot of borrowers and a lot of lenders talking to each other is, is the goal that they need to be working towards. And, um, and with AI, you'll be able to make better sense of uh, what's happening in the, in the conversations and what are the trends and, and what are the possibilities that you can sell into. So it's not a product-centric approach but a, um, you know, a, 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 trans, a conversation centric approach where uh, platforms today need to be uh, much more attractive uh, as, a, uh, as a conversation point uh, rather than as a point for uh, you know, selling uh, financial services. So a lot of thinking needs to change um, in the way in which we think financial services is deployed. Uh, we cannot be product centric. And even if we are, uh, the product must change. If the product doesn't change, then you're nothing but an alternative to a, uh, to a traditional bank. Um, and in many countries, even in the US, uh, the, the power of the traditional banks is something that cannot be, um, you know, that cannot be uh, broken down into because uh, they have incredible power in terms of, uh, um, um, you know, in, in terms of pricing, in terms of distribution and all of that. So you need to change the rules on them. Uh, in order to uh, in order to make a difference to the industry uh, going forward. Excellent. Well, I have to thank you because I think this is the, actually the easiest interview that I've ever done. You basically interviewed yourself, um, but such so many good uh, points in there. And I really like thinking about what, what innovation looks like is not delivering the same product in a different way, but actually delivering a new product. And I think this is where a lot of people get stuck. I'd love to see a lot of the innovators listening to this take that advice and look at how they can push themselves 
push their colleagues to actually look at the fundamental products that we're able to offer and improve those in a way that does bring more people in, that makes some of these products more accessible to people around the world. Um, again, uh, we've been talking with Emmanuel Daniel. I would encourage anybody listening to check out his book, The Great Transition, uh, The Personalization of Finance is Here. And of course, look into Tab Global for more of his insights. Emmanuel, thank you so much for taking the time to connect with me. It's been just fascinating hearing your perspective. Greg, thanks very much for having me on. Uh, and, you know, we just scratched the service. I, uh, you know, hope that we can uh, build on the conversation we had. Absolutely. Yeah, plenty more still to come. That's for sure. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening.